Capitol Theatre was designed in the early 1920s and completed in 1924 by Walter Billy Griffin and Marion Marnie, who were, as most people know, the architects for Canberra. Designed at a time when technology was changing and, you know, Melbourne was one of the fastest growing and richest capital cities in the world at that time. People were coming from all over the place to work here. The Capitol is arguably the most important building in Melbourne after the exhibition building, a building of significant world heritage status in my view. The work of Marion Marnie and Walter Billy Griffin here is probably the best work that they did in Australia or anywhere in the world. They were theosophists, followers of Rudolf Steiner, and they had visited Germany and they were, I think, familiar with the work of the Expressionists. But fundamentally, they were Chicago school architects from the school of Louis Sullivan and Frank Lloyd Wright. They had a very deep interest in nature and how the new forms of modernism could, in some ways, draw from the beauty of nature. So when the Capitol opened in 1924, it was an entirely modern concept. It incorporates both commercial uses for daytime and shopping and accommodation, but also for the evenings it has the cinema. This sort of what we call now mixed use concept was incredibly modern at the time. Other cinemas followed, however, they were designed in revival styles, whereas this was designed in a totally contemporary style by avant-garde architects. The key feature of the building is the ceiling. The concept was it was a crystalline experience that everybody could have this amazing experience when they went to the cinema. The architectural solution to that was uh, geometric panels, which are backlit with a series of coloured lights, uh, four colours of lights, red, green, blue and yellow. And the effect of that is a sort of a colour spectrum similar to what happens when white light hits a crystal. In a way, it's a very simple and easy to understand idea, but it's incredibly complex to realise in that very, in, oh, in the very primitive technology yeah. of the time. That is one of the really interesting things about this building is you're dealing with the primitive technology of the plaster, which is just moulds, and they're all a little bit crooked, but on mass and seen from a distance, it is really this repetitious, beautiful pattern, a bit like a grotto, I suppose. You could think of it as a cave with stalactites. A lot of people think of it that way. It has got that very welcoming, magical feeling about it, especially when the multicoloured lighting is on. It has this, an attraction to people that I think transcends most architecture. It, it is something that's very, very memorable. It also incorporated a completely democratic viewing experience where from all the seats, the experience was the same. And this was something that the Griffins were really interested in, in this democratic idea of viewing. So all the audience members had an equivalent experience. These large picture palaces were really important to sort of raise morale after World War I and this one was particularly innovative and spectacular. It really does evoke that swinging era of the early 1920s because it was an era of massive social change, which this building was a really big part of in Melbourne. I mean, it's worth mentioning Mary Amani in more detail because she was the key architect in this building. I mean, Walter Billy Griffin was involved all the way through, but Mary Amani's uh, initials are on every drawing that we've come across in the archives. So she was obviously the key designer of this building. Marion was born in 1871 in Chicago and she died there in 1961, aged 90. She was brought up by parents who were very interested in liberal reformist ideas. So they were interested in democracy, the arts, education. She followed one of her cousins into architecture and her education was paid for by one of the women within that circle. People aren't aware of her history. She was a member of Frank Lloyd Wright's office and in fact ran that office for she two years. She was the first employee. She was the first employee. She, I think she was one of the first female architects in, in America. Second for, to graduate from MIT, I think. Uh, so she was an extremely capable architect in what was at that time the most famous architecture mm. practice in America. So she was someone of very high level of talent and ability. When she joined Walter Billy Griffin, who had also briefly worked with Frank Lloyd Wright to form their own office, 
I think it's fair to say she was the talent and uh, Walter was the businessman. Well, in the late 19th century and early 20th century, women in architecture were viewed with suspicion. It was more difficult for them to get into courses, to get their required apprenticeship and also to receive commissions. But Marion Marnie had the fortune of being surrounded by a very supportive group of women who were forward thinking. And, you know, the men that she worked with, both Frank Lloyd Wright and Walter Burley Griffin, were forward thinking and reformist. So she was fortunate to be part of a circle, or she made herself part of a circle that was supportive of her as a woman. When we came to the 60s, the building went through a lot of change, and that came from changes to the way that cinema was shown. Bigger cinemas were reducing in size. They couldn't get the capacity, and this had a huge capacity. It had 2,000 seats. What they did is they ran the arcade through below the building. I mean, even in the 60s, there was pressure to preserve historic buildings such as this that had obvious importance from a heritage point of view. So a lot was destroyed, but there was pressure at that time to retain the building. And I think the compromise was that the superstructure of the building was retained, the ceiling was retained, because the ceiling was seen as the key element. The foyer areas that could be retained were retained, but they were blocked off to try and improve the fire safety of the building. And the arcade was put through to improve, if you like, the economics of the building. Now, unfortunately, uh, the building would probably be a World Heritage Building if that work had not happened. We're lucky that people like Robin Boyd and others at the time fought for as much preservation as was possible. He's called it the greatest cinema ever built or ever likely to be built. Although it's fallen into disrepair and disuse at various times, it's never fallen out of people's hearts. People have always recognised it as one of the great buildings of Melbourne and one of the great build buildings of Australia. My brother, Fred Briggs, was involved in here probably the late 50s, 60s. Well, he started off as a projectionist and then they elevated him as a manager. I also believe that Fred was probably the first Indigenous projectionist in Australia. Freddie had this unconditional respect and about family and what it meant to be strong Indigenous person in a very challenging society. We never saw ourselves as victims when we were around my brother or my mum, and it led a lot of my family to take leadership as well. We took over the lease, um, it was 1987, so it was just three years after we'd gone into the Longford Cinema. We did open with great aplomb. It was probably, and I've had a lot of opening lights in my lifetime in the industry. This was probably, I would say in memory, one of the best we ever had. I think if you reflect the whole thing, everyone would agree that you couldn't get a more magnificent cinema. But I think even at the time, one considered that the, you know, the architecture was quite spectacular and therefore it had to be a cultural place that was going to last. Back in 2004, I completed my fourth short clay animated film, Harvey Crumpet. And one of the first screenings I had was at the Melbourne International Film Festival. We were the opening night film. And one of our screenings was here at the Capitol. And six months later, we we're very lucky to win the Academy Award in Hollywood. So it was great to have the film shown here in my hometown where I made it to the people who'd helped me made it. They were here as well. And it was, uh, yeah, it was a big honour. RMIT University bought the Capitol in 1999 and they ran lectures. They also used it for Melbourne International Film Festival and Melbourne International Comedy Festival, as well as other major cultural events in the city. In 2014, the venue had grown into such disrepair that they needed to close it and prepare for the major renovation, which we now see today. This work really goes back to our original master plan for the building in 1999. And so the great thing to be given the opportunity to do by RMIT is actually to fully realise something that we worked with them on uh, now 20 years ago. The general idea was let's bring the building back to life, trying to make it feel like every part of the building that's original is celebrated and every part that we put in, we're just going, okay, here's a new bit, don't worry about it too much. Either it's keeping you safe or it's giving you a lift access through all the levels of the building. 
or it's feeding some air conditioning somewhere, or it's going to make the place much more usable for events and functions. Just giving the building more life is really the key thing. Some of the updates to the building that have happened since the new renovation include a ceiling full of customizable lighting. Other upgrades include a 7.1 surround sound system, a retractable screen, a new fly tower, rigging capabilities, and of course, um, opening up the stage so we can do light theatre and conferences as well as cinema. RMIT's vision for reopening the capital was that it should be a centre for media, cinema and culture, not only for its own students, but for the film industry here in Melbourne. Like the exhibition buildings and like Flinders Street Station, I think the public engage with it in a very different way to most buildings. They really feel like because they've been there, it belongs to them or they feel part of it. You know, because of that, it becomes part of the city. It's not just an architectural artefact. So I think that the importance of it being refurbished is that everybody in Melbourne is going to get to revisit it and another whole generation will have their own experiences of visiting the capital.